All right, Gabriel here with another guide. Um, this time it's geared toward all you completionists out there looking to get these expert challenges out of the way. Got some tips and tricks, and uh, yeah, let's get right into it here. So uh, I've listed out each combo that I used to be at. Uh, you know, there's probably other combos that work just fine, but this is what I used, and it was pretty consistent for all of these. Like most of them, I beat first try. A few of them took a few tries, but that was usually me playing around with different combos. And once I landed on each of these listed combos, it was usually the first try I'd win, maybe the second or third on a few of these. Um, but yeah, anyway, uh, as always, I got timestamps listed below. So whatever challenge you're stuck on, just go ahead and click on the, the uh, chapter and it'll bring you right to that part of the video. Uh, and also, just to plug a few of my other guides, you'll notice some consistencies here. Um, with a lot of these combos, there's three in particular. So anytime you see uh, the melting remnant and stitching guard here, that's gonna pretty much go right on line with my firelight little fade guide. Uh, so I'll link those in the video description as well. Uh, and that'll give you a really good breakdown on how to do those combos. And once you know how to do those combos, you can kind of get through a lot of these. Um, and the other two would be uh, Umbra and Awoken. That's my Primordium guide. That's pretty good for a lot of these, just being able to kind of mindlessly scale out things uh, allows you to get around a lot of the downsides in these challenges. And then uh, the third one would be the Awoken and Stygian Guard combo. And it, it, it also, if you see the Stygian Guard primary, um, that variant is pretty much the same strategy. That's just going to be my Incant combo guide, um, which is probably the most powerful combo that I know of um, and it's used on a few of these as well just because it's so nice especially the very hard ones like Blighted Existence that's going to be the winner there and then for the others uh, there's a few more specific ones to each challenge but I'll go over those in each uh, little breakdown here so let's uh, get into it here um, first one was Controlled Chaos there's a few of these that really let's be honest aren't challenges um, this is one of them this one's pretty much going to be easier than your average Covenant 25 run. Uh, and you could really use anything on this one. I used, I used Stygian and Umbra. My thought was, uh, you know, since you're uh, throwing out all your basic cards, uh, Tethys, part of her balancing is around the fact that uh, the Spears are pretty bad basic cards to kind of make up with for how powerful she was. So I figured... I pretty much throw out the entire downside of those Stitch and Spears while keeping all the upside of having Tethys. And then Umbra is a secondary. I didn't, not a whole lot of thought went in there, but my thought was um, I could get Crucible Collector with some consistency, if not that, at least like Crucible Warden or something, as kind of a guaranteed backup plan to killing bosses for some of those bosses that are like sweepers or that have spikes and whatnot, because uh, those ones are going to kill Tethys. But not much else going on there. I mean, Hellvent is one of the most, if not the, it's one of, if not the most powerful map events you can go to. Um, and to be able to get that uh, at any shop is pretty damn powerful. And obviously your basic cards are generally going to be the weaker cards in the game. And just trading them for random cards is a pretty much net upgrade. Uh, so that's really uh, not much to go over on Controlled Chaos. It should be pretty easy. If you've been able to beat Covenant 25, that shouldn't be any harder. And then uh, this one, Stewardship. Uh, I wouldn't say it's really all that hard. Um, it at least has some a negative downside in that it has the Tithe. And Tithe is present on a few of these challenges. Um, some general advice I'd say with Tithe is like, yeah, it kind of sucks, but it's not too bad. Um, one thing about it is you really don't have to go out of your way to take on money trials or to try to kill the collectors. I mean, every little bit of gold helps, but the fact that they're halved uh, means that you're really not getting a huge benefit uh, in bending over backwards tr to try to get them. That being said, though, if you think you could, you know, if you think you can get them, go ahead and do it. Just don't go out of your, you know, if it's going to cost you a lot of pyre health to do so, maybe you, maybe you skip it in that case. But, you know, with this one, there's not much more to go over. Um, you're, you're starting with the uh, powerful stewards, you know, with the multi-strike and whatnot. Uh, so this one, you know, this goes right into my firelight guide uh, because you're starting out with these multi-strike units and little fade um, on firelight is going to just buff them up so quickly. And 
from early to mid game, those stewards will pretty much carry you through. And then if you can just add some decent banner units, like here I have Silophyte and Siren of the Sea, um, they're going to do just fine. And you pretty much won't have much trouble with this one. Also, uh, you know, the nice thing about Stygian as a secondary or primary is just their high quality spells. Sometimes a little fade, it, there might be a few of those early rounds where you're still kind of setting up your scaling. And it's nice to have things like Titan's Gratitude with some spell power, uh, things like that to, uh, you know, finish off those early minions. Spellcraft. Um, another one I didn't particularly find too hard. Um, this one fits right into my Primordium and Awoken strategy. Uh, you know, just uh, get a high quality unit. In this case, I had Shattered Shell, which for me is like the second best unit in that strategy. Best one to be Animus of Will. Um, full breakdown if you click that link. But uh, anyway, you know, just try to get a high quality unit and uh, let them do work. Then I, the thing is, like, Awoken really does a good job around uh, of kind of mitigating the downside of this. Um, you know, it's like a minus two to draw each turn or whatever it is. You know, there's just so many um, nice draw options available to Woken that they work really well in this. And then uh, Umbra, the nice thing is like, you don't have to play a whole lot of cards to make Primordium work. Just to, finding a few high quality ones, even something like a Razor Sharp Edge or, or whatnot, just sticking it on them early. Um, that's gonna just sort of give you value every turn regardless of if, you're, if you have cards to play or not. And uh, so that's pretty much what's going on there. Um, nice. Another nice thing about this one is you'll notice have like blazing bolts and excavation eruption. Uh, there's the um, the minus to cost. So um, kind of just nice to have those more expensive spells just automatically cheaper. And uh, that's pretty much spellcraft. Another one I don't feel too many people are going to have issues with. Um, True champion, and this is probably the most gimme of all of them. I mean, getting Dante from the start is just stupidly easy. Uh, there's, you know, like, uh, there's no way that, uh, as good as most champs are, they're not going to outclass uh, Dante. So trading them for John Dante is just a strict upgrade in almost every case. I figure you might as well go Awoken and Stitch and Guard with the uh, Incant strategy. Uh, you know, Awoken just has so many nice stat upgrades you can stick on to Dante. And then between Awoken and Stygian, there's a lot of good tanks. In this case, I was using Guardia then named, but you know, any of the Hollows would work. Uh, the Titan Sentry would work. Even a Vine Mother would would have worked. But, uh, you know, Guardian in the name with double incant, why not? And uh, it was, yeah, there's really no downside to this one, so not much to go over there. Now, Overcharged. Uh, I thought this one was pretty fun. Um, still not into the hard category yet, I would say. Um, you know, the downside seems bad, but you do get two damage shield on your Fragile Pyre, and it's not too hard to only allow two hits, really. Um, especially when you factor in, you got these massive bonuses here. So you get the extra floor space, um, and then... Uh, uh, what is this? The uh, the ember. Um, God, why can't I think of that? But anyway, so uh, the thing about this is it works, fits right into that melting remnant uh, stitch and guard strategy that I have, the fire firelight. Because right off the bat, you have this extra floor space, so you can just start filling that floor, your super floor, with things, and kind of who cares about your pirate at that point like you, you'll you scale so fast because you know you, you think about it like little fade the way it scales is it's as a horizontal scaling so like the more units you have on the floor the more value you get out of every extinguish so in this case it's like i could have train steward draft all these things on one floor um and that's just an insane amount of damage. You know, I, I love at the third level you're getting 30 damage each extinguish even just one of those is almost enough to to kind of kill everything in the game. Um, so I think that's a pretty good strategy for this one. It, it you know, it, it could be hard, I, I, I would say, if you don't scale fast enough early, but the big floor with this strategy should hopefully get around that. As long as you don't, you know, you, you might have to start on the top floor or whatnot just to allow yourself time to draw your units, but uh, that shouldn't be too bad. 
might have to skip some marks of invasions too, but you know, it is what it is. Now, Evil Eyes, this one I would say is the first one that was kind of truly challenging um, because there's really no huge positive on this challenge. Uh, the only positive I would say is because your units have permadeath, that means uh, your stewards will get very quickly purged out, which is pretty nice for like deck consistency. But it is certainly something where now you have to really modify your strategy to win. So on this one, I didn't really use a, a strategy in particular that I have a guide for. So just to outline it really quick, it was pretty specific how I had to beat this because, you know, your units have permadeath, so you really can't afford to be losing good banner units. Uh, and then they're all heartless, so you can't heal them. Um, there's a few things you could try. I mean, I, I at first I thought, okay, maybe uh, maybe like Hellhorn would be good because they have armor or Umbra. You know, Umbra has a life steal, but they also have all the damage shield. Um, and it, you know, but then it dawned on me, why not just take Awoken? Even though there's so much healing with Awoken, uh, at the same time, the Sentient... Uh, particularly the path I went here was the revenge path, which gives her a ton of health. I basically just said, I'm going to make Sentient be my tank, because I can lose her every fight. The thing is, it's really hard to make a banner unit tank work for this one, because you risk losing them. And if you lose your tank that you've put all your resources into, that's probably going to be run ending. In this case, you're not going to find a much better tank than sentient um especially the, the the revenge path um revenge it's gonna allow you to just draw a crap load of uh, cards each turn uh it has enough health that you can typically survive through a lot of minion waves as well as the boss which you can't really say for a lot of these other ones um and then also awoken has animus of will in this and by the end i used dante here because why not if you're offered it but i will say i had animus as it was my game plan, and Animus would have worked just fine here as well. Uh, but um, once I got Dante, I just figured, well, why not just have my Animus die out? Uh, it's easy enough to uh, purge your units in this strategy since they have permadeath. You just put them on the floor and let them die. And then Stygian Guard's going to help with just trying... You know, there's a lot of uh, damage mitigation uh, available to Stygian Guard. So, you know, here I have... Uh, I can. I have Siren Song if I need it. I can just throw people to the top. I was usually setting up at the top. Uh, there's like Urchin Spines plus just damage, which is going to usually clear out most of the, the things. Uh, Frenzied Swarm is pretty god tier for this challenge. I mean, obviously, just making everything not attack you is going to save you a ton of health. And uh, Wildwood Tome for Awoken is also very good. Um, if you can't find quick upgrade on your unit, there's always Wildwood Tome, which is going to prevent a ton of damage. And thing, you know, there's things like Ensnare, which are going to prevent the units, you know, give you just that extra turn that you might need um, to scale out or find some cards that you need. And then you just got, you know, on top of Sentient getting you a lot of draw, there's other awesome draw things like Invigorating Solution. You'll see here I even... Uh, uh, Ember or Eternal stoned it so I could like keep playing it. Um, yeah, and you'll see here I, I faced Seraph the Temperament who has a lot of damage incoming, and I couldn't even find you know, I found a glimmer, but uh, it was so late in this run that all I could really do is put a surge stone on it, so I couldn't like put it on holdover or anything. But uh, just the, the setup I have here, you know, Ice Tornado, um. Fine grass. I had a lot of things that could kill those, especially once I got the Wildwood Tome on Dante. There just wasn't much damage they could do to me. So Evil Eyes, probably the first tough one here, but definitely beatable. I think this is a pretty good path to go down. Try to get Sentient Revenge. You could use the other ones too. They just they provide damage, but they at the same time don't really provide as much health, which I found I just valued the health more. But probably any version of the scent it would be fine. Also, the obviously since those basic um, regen cards uh, don't do anything here, you may as well because um, everything's heartless. You may as well just purge them ASAP. Luckily, they uh, can be purged pretty quickly since your stewards are already naturally getting purged. Now, arcane focus. Um, this one was it was okay. 
Um, now I will say the one that I, even though I, I have melting and awoken here, I didn't actually mean to pick awoken as my secondary here. I would say melting and stygian would be would you, kind of the standard melting stygian strategy is what I would go with here. Um, it would have been a lot better, but I was able to still get by uh, with Woken in this case, but it would have been a lot easier with Stygian, so I definitely recommend Melting and Stygian here. Now, the reason for all that is, you know, you got the Tithe. We've kind of talked about Tithe. Nothing's really different here, but uh, everything enters with Spell Weakness. So Stygian, pretty much a given. You know, you want you want Stygian. I, I was kind of angry at myself for not doing that, but if I won, I won. It just shows that this combo is good enough. If Stygian was there, it would just be that much easier. But uh, so anyway, like you got spell weakness, so you want to take advantage of that. I wasn't able to take too much advantage of that, other than like glimmer, glimmers here, um, and every now and then a restoration detonation, uh, maybe some thorns. But that's about it. If you could hit them with things like ice storm or ice tornado and and all yeah you know, there's helical crystallis just so many spells pretty much every spell is going to be great in stygian uh, but then the other part here is your units enter dazed um so my thinking was uh you know assuming i have stygian here instead of these husk hermits i would have had either of those sweepers because the sweepers just work so well um in this in the in the firelight strategy and then i had lady of the reformed which was the perfect tank for that but uh anyway you know you, you enter with the, the two dazed so you're gonna want to start on the top or middle if you start on the bottom then you're committing to letting three um or two you're committing to two waves getting by without getting hit by your minions but if you start on the top or the middle you're at least going to have those first units you, you, uh, that you played uh, able to attack the second wave of enemies. So that's kind of the positioning strategy you want to do there. And uh, otherwise, just kind of the, the general strategy, you know, scale your units out. Um, I was able to survive here, but I was, I think mainly because I had this uh, pyre, these pyre health uh, regenerations. If I was Stygian, I wouldn't have had to regenerate that much pyre health. The thing was, since I wasn't Stygian, units just kept coming by but if i am stygian then i can typically with that spell damage kill that first wave just fine and then i wouldn't need that so that's kind of what's going on there uh, but otherwise just you know follow the melting remnant and stygian guide and you should be fine here once you you know once the dazed clears up uh there's not really much different you know you just scale the same and kill things just the same you have the added bonus now of having having um, spell weakness so it's really actually not that hard of a challenge uh, and but I would make a quick note here um, Seraph the patient oh man now I have the other I have the Seraph guide right and I mentioned that I, I do think Seraph the patient is the hardest but still um, consistently beatable right if you prepare correctly now I will say on these challenges um, the 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 power level difference of seraph the patient is just amplified so much more on these challenges especially in some of the harder ones uh as we get into the later ones here uh, i will you know i will say i don't think there's any shame in just re-rolling if you see seraph the patient because i i remember this specific run it was so painful to beat seraph the patient like i it came down like I had to reform on every single floor, which is not easy to do with this strategy because it's not really meant to do that, uh, but it's there if you need it. And I, it came down to like the last little bit of pyre health for me to beat Seraph the Patient, I even though I stomped through most of the end game otherwise. So the, the, there was other challenges where, you know, I kind of bust my ass to get through the whole thing and then it's just impossible to beat Seraph the Patient at the end. So I, I honestly, after a certain point on these challenges, especially those harder ones, I just started re-rolling when I saw Seraph the Patient. I don't think there's any shame in that. It's, de it's definitely the, the, the power level of Patient is just so much greater than the other Seraphs that, you know, you already have to deal with these challenges. If you're just trying to complete them, why why put yourself through the torture of beating Seraph the Patient, right? So uh, just a little note there. And uh, I guess this one I did it too. But actually on this one, I'll, I'll get to that later. But uh, so Corrosive Cash, this one... 
I didn't really think it was too bad. It, it looks scary, but once, at least if you have the setup I have here, this is another one where I used kind of a, a specific setup for it. Uh, basically, I just, I figured I'd take Sentient as my main. And the thing about Sentient uh, Spikes in particular is it's almost, as long as you can keep her alive, it's almost a benefit that the enemies are multi-striking you, right? Because you're going to get a lot of um, thorns or spikes. And uh, getting basically double value out of those is only going to help your cause. As for the the to the two health each turn and the the gold, the gold you're just going to kind of have to deal with. It's not too bad. It, I would say Tithe loses you way more gold than this downside does, but just know you're going to have a little less gold than normal. Um, you're inclined to make you know smaller floors. Like in this case, by the end I only had the 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 one banner unit and sentient um I, I don't think you necessarily have to go that hard on that it just sort of worked out for me here um that i had a really good dps unit behind my sentient and i didn't really want to bother with any other banner units but uh uh you know and and, and as for the minus two health a turn nice thing about sentient primary or the awoken primary is you have those regen options uh even if you miss on everything else so you'll always be able to at least mitigate that two health loss for your backline units pretty consistently but ideally you're getting some better um some better healing in this particular case i didn't actually really have great healing but you can see it still worked out fine like really my only healing was restoration detonation um restoring retreat <laughs> which <laughs> Is weird because obviously I'm not using it to overstack anything here, but I was just using it to heal. But then spreading spores was good enough. Like I, I was able to get two of these at zero cost. It didn't. It was still pretty slow because they weren't double stacked or anything. But uh, with the amount of a decent card draw and whatnot, so it ended up working out fine. I had other ways to mitigate damage too, of course. Like uh, frenzied swarm was always pretty top tier for that. Um, Restoration Detonation will usually kill a Frontliner. Um, this wasn't upgraded, so it wasn't really that powerful, but usually I had other things. Like Siren Song will definitely go a long way to mitigate damage. In this one, the reason I had them uh, permafrosted and even held over was specifically for Patient, just kind of showing how much, how much overcompensation you have to do to prepare for the Patient. So... I knew I wasn't going to, with that, my lack of healing, there was no way I was going to survive Seraph the Patient. So what I had to do is really set up at the top and use these Siren Songs to stack so much, uh, uh, what do you call it, dazed on Seraph the Patient is the only way to beat him. And I think it was after this fight that I, I started, started just re-rolling Seraph the Patient because I was so tired of dealing with him. But that's kind of the strategy here, you know, and also, by the way, your own, remember this multi-strike applies to your units too. So uh, if you have a good, um, a good backliner, like Nameless Siren here, I had quick on her and a little bit of armor to mitigate uh, the, the minus two. And she was doing some serious work. Uh, multi-strike with Nameless Siren, as long as you're not against Seraph the Chaste, this is going to be pretty dang powerful pretty hard to beat um yeah and that's corrosive cash preloaded uh preloaded um is another pretty good one for the primor uh, primordium awoken uh combo the thing is like you can just take any you know i, I took husker and Bet a shattered shell here I was basically gonna, if I saw any of the high quality units, I'd just keep adding them to see if the upgrade it came with was better than the last. But really, you don't even necessarily need that much of an upgrade, especially depending on the Seraph you're facing. Like, uh, Seraph the Chase, it doesn't matter too much because the unit, the unit waves are not too hard and, uh, you know, it'll clear some particular buffs, but in this case, I wasn't really relying too much on that. Uh, and then the, I guess I have these Wildwood Saps, but those are really just to get me through the early game. Um, I still used them at the end. As long as you put, the, with Chaste, you know, try to put Eternal Stone on Wildwood Saps, that way you can keep reapplying them. And then by the time the, the relentless, uh, relentless rounds come away, you can really stack some, uh, stack some of that Wildwood Sap. 
but anyway, you know, primordium, you know, just stack the razor sharp edge is going to be huge. Root seeds are always good. You'll notice I actually put Emberstone in literally all five of them just so they're all free. It's going to give you pretty good card draw engine while getting your primordium buffed up decently to get the constant damage to your units. Um, yeah, that's pretty much And Prismal Dust, obviously, is going to be even better than Wildwood Sap, but against Chaste, it still needs to be reapplied. In this case, I couldn't find any reapplication, so I just, I basically just left one on Permafrost for later, but that's about it. Just Primordium, get your, uh, get your units working well and should be good there. And Pure Chance, this one is one that, uh, I guess I did another specific, um, combo for. Um, my thinking here, uh, was that, you know, hell, you're starting with Volatile Gauge, so why not pick the two um, clans that have by far the biggest uh, Ember Cost cards, right? Hellhorned has all these spells and units, you know, they got Demon Fiend at a 4 cost, uh, Consumer of Crowns at a 10 cost, um, and spells such as, you know, Inferno is a 3 cost, um, the tome as a five cost. You're just you're getting a lot of value out of Hellhorn, and then also Umbra. Um, you know they have all those four cost spells, like uh, four four cost spells, like um, Excavated Ember, or what is it? Ex Excavation Eruption. Uh, there's also Blazing the three cost Blazing uh, Bolts. Um, there's also the uh, the four cost one that gives you damage shield and a bunch of morsels so and then there's obviously shadow siege if i was hoping i could hit on that i've never really hit on shadow siege with volatile gauge but that's kind of my dream uh but anyway demon fiend was just fine in this case like that's all you all i really needed to, to hit on here was demon fiend and uh as for the upgrades i would say unless you don't find hidden passage or cave in or even to a lesser extent tireless climb I mean, those are the cards that are pretty consistent that would allow you to build a super floor without needing pip, scape, pip space upgrades. Uh, hopefully you find those cards. If you don't, then you might consider pip space upgrades because you do still need like a pretty good floor to make, to beat this, uh, to, to, well, to beat Seraph uh, in any case. But, you know, you don't need draw upgrades because Volatile Gauge already gives you three extra draw and might as well just add Ember at that point. Um, it is also pretty nice that I got the Demon Strike um, artifact here. I will say, Hellhorn has such good artifacts that I I hunt hard for artifacts when I play Hellhorn. Um, they one of their one of the powerful just aspects of the clan is their large number of good artifacts. But anyway, you'll, yeah, you'll see a lot of the things I listed off here, like Inferno, Excavation, Eruption, One Horn's Tome, Demon Fiend, just high cost, awesome cards that you can get a lot of value out of. It's nice to start with Volatile Gauge because, you know, you just, um, you can build into it, which makes it a lot better. Now we got Round and Round. Uh, I will say, um, this was probably one of the tougher ones in my opinion. Uh, it's just, for me, the way I play, being able to target things really is central to a lot of my strategies. But... It turns out the Melting Remnant Stitching Card strategy works again pretty nicely for this one. You just want to focus uh, on the sort of indiscriminate uh, cards. So things like Ice Tornado are going to be great here because they literally no they lose no value. Um, they're doing the same thing they did before. Same with like Ice Storm. Um, you want to typically avoid some of the more targeted... Um, attacks or even buffs so like the buffs that you want things like whiplash are great like all all of the burnout extension cards are great because they don't have the capability of targeting the enemy so even on whiplash if you don't hit the exact target you want you're still hitting one of your own units which is nice um and hollow drippings is the probably the best because it again loses no value since it's indiscriminate in what it targets other things, you know, like Crystalline Seeds is pretty good. It's, uh, any any sort of flat AoE is going to be good. Like Titan's Tooth would have been great too. 
but other things like you know they might be okay if you need damage you add it but like like things like crypt builder i wasn't so keen on because it really wants to hit that front unit uh, it's not the worst thing if you have a lot of offering it still might work or a lot of discard i should say um but you know especially even on the the target your own unit side i mean or some of them would even hurt your own units you know like the the um the card that sort of shoots one enemy or shoots one unit and puts frostbite you know it's targetable on both sides so a lot of times you're just shooting your own person so that's not a good card to add and i would say pretty much every card i have in this end screen was pretty good except for intent on death i kind of added that toward the end thinking i wonder if it will like the the benefit if it hits your firelight is so huge that i thought maybe it would still be worth it I would say it, will, it wasn't. It really, it rarely ever was able to hit Firelight. It would often even trigger the Harvest uh, or like the um, the Extinguish uh, mechanic on an enemy. And then it ended up uh, just kind of backfiring on me. So I would say even Intent on Death, uh, which is normally so great in this combo, shy away from it. Just really shy away from anything that can really bite you from the targeting uh, thing. And then also... Beyond the targeting, the unit's getting shifted around. The nice thing about uh, the little fade strategy is with the shifting around, you're gonna lose the consistency of how much you are able to extinguish a little fade. So you're gonna miss out on a little bit of scaling and you're also gonna miss out uh, potentially on a lot of burnout. So you really wanna hunt for, if you see burnout extension cards, add them. Off, almost over anything unless there's a huge reason to add whatever card is next to it but uh and on top of that i would also uh, think about either putting them on like holdover or uh, even like i think a double stacked wicklash here um, or even just hell venting them uh all of those are good options as for units i would have probably preferred like uh the sweepers like but at any rate, Wickless Baron was fine here. I also had the, the Train Steward uh, artifact, so I just ended up using Train Stewards along with Wickless Baron. Normally, I'd probably add another banner unit otherwise, but you want banner units that can be a little bit tanky while also doing damage because you never know if they're going to be at the front or the back, so you kind of have to plan around that as well. But that's kind of round and round. I, I would say it was one of them that I had to try a few times to beat, um, but I was kind of trying with different combos. Once I hit this combo, I think I beat it the first time that I did it. So this combo definitely works for it pretty well. Um, just remember, Ice Tornado, Ice Storm, that's going to be your offensive friends. You'll notice I had four Ice Tornadoes here. I definitely held under one of them at one point. Um, and then Burnout Extension is going to be your, your friend. So AoE, indiscriminate stuff, stay away from single target things. No champion, no problem. I found this to be a pretty easy one. Um, even though you know most of the champs are pretty strong, you get a start with a banner unit right off the bat. I mean, as far as Stygian and Awoken goes, most of their banner units are pretty strong. So I just did uh, Stygian um, and Awoken combo here. Um, I had meant to not go, you know, the 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 non-exiled version of Stygian, but I think I just misclicked or forgot to change it. Uh, but I would say I'd generally, you know, why go Spike when you can go Frostbite? Frostbite's just kind of object objectively better almost. Uh, so definitely don't make that mistake, but it's not too big, big of a deal. Uh, at least with the Awoken, I still took the Root Seeds because Root Seeds are arguably, both, both Root Seeds and Forgone Power have my vote for the best basics in the game. Um, they're just so freaking versatile and great. Uh, but anyway, um, you know, you don't get a champ, so just try to get those extra um, banner units. And then you got this extra uh, proc here. I forget what they call it, but it's basically like, say, the reason I, I went incant here, I went heavy into the incant strategy because... Uh, you're incanting basically twice per turn. So, you know, that really strong incant artifact uh, is basically by default for your units. So why not do that, right? Uh, so for that for that reason, if you just target a nice incant strategy, you'll notice I had two of them here, the Nameless Siren and the Guard of the Unnamed. It's all I needed. I mean, I was pretty much guaranteed at that point to either get them all in turn one or at least have them by turn two. And then I'm just throwing everything 
down all these other high quality spells. I had Ancient Synergy on Holdover. Uh, that was pretty powerful. I mean, it just deletes frontliners, pretty much mitigated most of my pyre health damage on top of just having armor and whatnot. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty much uh, no champion, no problem. I will say it was definitely no problem for me. And uh, Dangerous Minds, I would say this one is surprisingly kind of tough. Um, and even though the, the time I won, uh, a lot of it had to do, I feel, with the incant, the fact that I started with the incant um, artifact, which is one of the better artifacts in the game. But anyway, on this one, I, I still went with the basically the typical Melting Remnant Stygian Guard um, strategy, you know, Firelight. Uh, but since I had the incant, I instead of focusing on sweepers, I figured Siren of the Sea would have would serve me better, just because I'm getting that double incant. Uh, but anyway, as for the the challenge, um, I didn't really. I, I when I first started it, I thought, oh, okay, this is obviously a Hellhorned one, right? Because there's not really much synergies in the game uh, revolving like unit types. Really, the main one I know of is imps. Um, so I figured, okay, if every unit counts as an imp i can make use of these maybe a high roll on consumer of crown but at, le at the very least i can use all these imp spells on it right and it turned out it really wasn't that good it's like m most of the time it's like okay well what would i be most of the imp things are like sacrificing your imp right so do i really want to sacrifice like a banner unit probably not and then other things like the tomb like I guess you get like a tomb artifact, so melting remnant might work because the tomb artifacts normally suck, but maybe they would be good with if every unit was that. But even then, I tried both those out; they didn't seem that powerful. Uh, so at a certain point, I just said, "Ah, screw it!" Like I'm not even going to try to make it take advantage of this particular um, mutator, uh, and I'm really just going to try to beat the the challenge kind of as is. Uh, so with the haste. The haste is surprisingly tough. Um, every wave having haste really doesn't give you much time to deal with the shit that's just constantly getting thrown right at your pyre, basically. Um, uh, you know, but all that being said, uh, little fade, the little fade strategy did make the most sense to me because I could basically put everything at the top and that means, uh, it just allows me to scale that uh, floor out kind of quicker. The, the scaling on Little Fate is pretty hard to beat. Uh, I think the Primordium scaling takes a little bit longer, so I, uh, the fact that everything was hasted, I didn't really have time to make that one work, so Little Fade made more sense in this case. Um, but anyway, yeah, you'll need quick scaling, and uh, as long as you have some high-quality banner units, you know, if you don't have the incant, I would say the sweepers will do just fine. Get either those sweeper units and... Uh, after one or two extinguishes, they should be clearing out pretty much the entire floor, especially if, in, if one of them has multi-strike or something like that. Um, and uh, you you might want to also, like like in this, you see how I made Siren of the Sea, kind of one of them was a tank and the other was DPS. You also kind of want to think about that because you aren't, aren't going to have too much time to like get your tanks scaled up um but you also want a lot of damage so having a frontliner that kind of is a hybrid damage dealer and tank is kind of ideal so like if i did the two sweeper strategy one of my sweepers would probably just have like armor incant or just health or or quick or something um something to mitigate some damage and then the backliner would ideally be the one with multi-strike and um yeah that's pretty much the deal there um as for uh, trying to think, what this particular uh, what was that? I forget what that mutator was. So that was dangerous minds. Oh right, double your drafts. Yeah. So I guess um, um, dangerous minds. So. Right, because if I, if I picked a sweeper, I would get two of them. If I pick Siren C, I get two. So you want to pick a unit that can double, basically, as a frontliner and a backliner. So also, even like uh, Wickless Baron would work fine there. Uh, you don't want to fill up... Another thing, even when you're taking spells, you want to be a little bit picky, because it's 
super, it, it can be either a positive or a negative. If you're adding mediocre stuff to your deck and duplicating it, that's not good. So kind of stick away from the mediocre stuff unless you really need it. Uh, try to really just take the high value stuff because then when you get that double uh, draft on the high value stuff, it just, um, it's pretty powerful. But yeah, surprisingly hard. I don't know. It didn't seem like just a simple haste would be that hard, but I found that to be one of the harder ones. Um, extra pain train. Now we get to the real challenges. Um, yeah, this one's a tough one. Uh, but I will say, uh, going, uh, soul guard is pretty good here. Um, the thing about soul guard is she doesn't get affected by the spikes. It's not a whole lot of spikes, but it could be relevant if you have a squishy champ that is still attacking. Like Tetris certainly doesn't want to be used here. Um, and then the stealth, uh, nice thing about soul guard dire channel. I, I think really go for dire channel here. Dire channel still hits a stealth unit. So you're going to be hitting them with, you know, hundred damage or how much, however much you can scale to. In this case, I had the, the artifact again. So with that artifact, I was getting a lot of scaling there. Um, but yeah, they won't, they won't survive too long, even though I have a, even though they start with all that haste, uh, all that stealth. If they're getting damaged, as long as you have a, a frontliner that can handle it. In this case, I had endless, kind of your standard, uh, standard endless um, Titan Sentry with some health. And in fact, I had two of them just because I kind of needed it. Uh, that was uh, plenty here. Even Vine Mother can be an okay tank, uh, but Titan Sentry is obviously preferable. And then add in Siren of the Sea here and there just for, for some extra DPS. Um, and uh, yeah, fun fact, this was my first Bone Dog uh, run, so that was uh, nice to get that card. But apparently it's like super common now, so not that cool of a thing anymore. But uh, yeah, Extra Pain Train. Uh, you're going to need some way to take on the bosses. If you don't have, like the only two champs I can see working on this, at least with any consistency, are going to be Soul Guard with Dire Channel. Or alternatively, you could use... Uh, the sentient with either spikes or the rejuvenation bombs. Um, either of those champs uh, are going to be able to take on a stealth boss pretty easily. Uh, you know, the sentient that could totally work too. I just I figured um, Stygian exiled and awoken exiled are a little bit more powerful, just both in terms of their basic. Um, cards that they get and also uh dealing with spikes i feel like just incant generally if you, if you go heavy on the incant there's so many you know you got this incant buff you can put on any unit uh and then they got units like siren of the sea or even guardian unnamed that just sort of naturally scale with incant so that's a great way to mitigate the spikes and then also with the uh stitch and exiled it's pretty good uh to have these dead weight targets just thrown out even more so on the other dead weight challenge but we'll get to that one later so that's pretty much extra pain train um i actually you know with soul guard it's it's actually not super bad uh also awoken with root seeds is great um because obviously you have all these extra dead weights so you really want some extra card draw to get around that fragile collection um this is another one. I, so I basically did my typical Primordium strategy, except this time instead of uh, Awoken as my secondary, which is kind of the standard, I went with Hellhorned. Just because I felt Hellhorned provided a little bit more to deal with the fragility than Awoken would, because obviously all the healing Awoken has is going to be a moot point. Um, so what you sacrifice really is a lot of those good flat stat gains and a lot of the good banner units, but because let's be honest, Hellhorn banner units suck. However, I did get the one good Hellhorn unit in this run. I wouldn't bank on that though. It is a rare. It's not like super common to get a rare, but the nice thing about this is, uh, even before I had the deranged brute, I was probably going to win this run anyway. The, the nice thing about this run is you get that extra um, spells, the extra upgrade slot. So you can turn a bad banner unit into a good banner unit uh, just simply from the fact that you have those extra slots. 
And then the, the reason Hellhorn works so nicely on this one with fragility, especially the, uh, the exiled version of Hellhorns, is the, the implings give you these extra targets. Because remember, the fragility, it only applies to the first unit you play each turn. So a lot of times with the implings, you can just play an impling somewhere, then you don't have to deal with the fragility on your banner and primordium units. Uh, but if you don't hit on that, which is going to happen, uh, the nice thing is between Umbra and Hellhorn, you have a lot of ways to mitigate fragility because you have uh, damage shield and you also have armor. Both of those are going to prevent fragility from uh, triggering. And also remember, Superfood Primordium, uh, not only we, it's pretty commonly known that it transfers the damage shield, but I think it's less commonly known that it transfers the armor. So if you put armor on Primordium, it'll start stacking that armor to your frontliner each turn as well. That's a lot of armor you can get. I didn't particularly need it in this run just because I had um, the Prismal Dust, um, which was really my defensive option here. I had Fortifies as well too, but those aren't going to give you a ton. They're nice to have though, at least early game. Uh, and I even used like an end flame, but at any rate, you I almost kind of I, I low rolled on the defensive here kind of, and it was still fine. Uh, you can high roll and have an even better time defensively at least. Now on offense, I pretty much rolled as good as, good as you're going to get. You know, I had deranged brute. I was able to find multi strike. Um, also. Uh, remember, Rage works really nice with uh, Rage and also One Horn's Tome. I mean, you're probably going to be fragile anyway by late game. Uh, and, uh, you know, who cares if you're fragile? But uh, what you really want is that multi strike. So, being able to stack that multi strike on Superfood Primordium is pretty dang good. You're going to get so much multi strike per turn that uh, it just makes the fights kind of trivial, trivial at that point. Um, but also things like Ritual of Battle, which normally are kind of a crappy card. Uh, if you can get some Ember upgrades on them, pretty good with Primordium. I mean, 10 Rage on your Primordium, that's going to add you 20 flat damage a turn to your Frontliner on top of if you have Super Food, it'll stack that Rage over. So it's actually 40 damage a turn, you know, and then you just keep stacking it and you just get stupid amounts of damage on your Frontliner. So this one with this combo, I think you could consistently beat it. Uh, a lot and then also I had some other nice things here like this this uh, I forget the name of this artifact but it basically dazes the top floor is super good with the when you're fragile and uh, when you have primordium um, that was able to probably be the reason I got around my low roll on defensive options so yeah again go to my primordium guide and I will give you a full breakdown on like things that are good there um, homework, it's technically no downside other than annoyance, um, but I recommend just going this, the typical Primordium route here with the Awoken se uh, Secondary. Reason being, you can pretty much just mindlessly scale out your top, uh, you know, your dudes, especially if you end up with Furnace Tap like I did here. I even put it on a holdover. Um, you know, if you get that, uh, you don't really have to worry about calculations, um, but really anything that would normally beat the game should be fine. It's just, it's nice to do something that's a little more brainless or brainless. Um, so Primordium Awoken is going to be your winner here. Just a uh, typical strategy there. Check that guide out if you, if you need to know what's going on there. Steward Stack, I didn't really find this to be hard. I didn't know, there's a few of these in the late you know, it, it seemed like the challenges were generally getting harder as I went down the list, but then there's random ones like this that really weren't too hard. Now, granted, I did kind of high roll here with this minus two to unit energy artifact, but I don't think it, it was just kind of nice to have, I would say. Like, maybe I wouldn't have been able to play two units turn one or whatnot, but like, again, with the primordium strategy, you're never really needing to do that. And really, the only reason I had the extra ones was um, because you start with uh, sketches. So, so really, the big thing here is you know you start with sketches of salvation, uh, which throws all four random units into the middle floor. Um, given that, I figured I was not going to um, really remove any stewards because I wanted there to be a high chance of the stewards getting thrown in. 
And then as for my good high quality DPS unit, I basically, anytime I saw them, I added them and then I was not going to remove them. And I couldn't really spare really pouring much upgrades into anything. I tried to, I tried to spread it out across train stewards and my banner units because, you know, some of these, some of these fights, Anim Sewell is going to be in the middle. Maybe even both of them will be and Anne Husk Kermit or something. Uh, and in those cases, I'll have to make a train steward be my target from Primordium. So I really just wanted options at, at all of these um, uh, to basically have a good target for my Primordium. But I wasn't able to really focus any much on any one unit. But if you just spread out uh, good high quality units, you have a pretty good chance of getting like, say, an Animus of Will or something as, in your start. And that's really all there is there. It's this really this, the typical strategy beyond that. You're not really putting units down after turn one. So the minus, uh, the plus two ember cost on them really isn't going to be an issue. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it there. And largest lads, this one was surprisingly hard as well. Um, it seems like there's going to be a lot of benefits because it's like oh cool i can naturally make a super floor um without really having to do anything but that extra two pip to every uh, or the extra pip to every unit is just brutal um so i did uh happen to high roll on this run by getting a cavern event you know the one that basically gives you a pip on every floor if I hadn't got that, I would have probably just went pip for my first upgrade. I think one into pip is pretty necessary for this one because you really want to get on your first turn the ability to play your champ and a banner unit, or at least like two banner units, all on the same floor. Otherwise, that first wave is just going to come by pretty much unscathed. Uh, another thing you got to realize or remember is like, hopefully, you can either uh, put those units on the bottom or top. I generally preferred uh, the bottom if I could, but obviously if there's a ton of damage coming in and you can't survive it, you're going to have to do it on the top. And if the pip space kind of screws you over on the top, then you're going to have to do it on the middle. In either of those cases, that first wave is going to get by unscathed unless you can get some good Stygian uh, follow-up cards to, to take them out with. Um, and, uh, but yeah, so, so basically typical, uh, Awoken and Stygian incant strategy. Uh, I went with Soul Guard in this case, just simply because it had less pip space than Wildenton. I probably would have preferred Wildenton, but the fact that Wildenton takes that extra pip space just really makes it hard to, to use him in this strategy. I think it could still work fine. Like you'd probably just put him on the bottom. And you can't play anything else with them there, but you can just count on the banner units coming down the next turn. But I think I like to sculpt Soul Guard a little bit better in this case. Um, just sort of gets faster scaling on the damage to at least get some more. Really, the, the main problem with largest lads is like those first two to three waves. If you can't get much damage on them and that happens a few fights in a row, you're going to die. Like you're just going to take too much pyre damage. And that's really how I lost a, f a few times with this. Um, but uh, as long as you can get some, you know, I had some high quality damage here and I would have liked even more, but you know, I had the two Titans Gratitudes with Surge Stone, that Helical Crystallis, you know, Glimmer and Ice Storm aren't bad either. I would have liked more, but it was at least enough to allow me to survive. And then on top of that, I then had the, the pretty good incant synergy with Sirens of the Sea along with Soul Guard. And then also, now I had Lodestone Totem here. I will say it didn't really, it was pretty awkward to play. Um, I would almost say I would have been better off without it. So, uh, you know, you may need it on a run, but I'd say if you have like two Sirens of the Sea, probably don't bother with the Lodestone Totem. It's a lot of energy to put down and turn ones, turns one to two is so important that pouring all of that energy into a Lodestone Totem that is probably not even going to be on the right floor that you want it to be on for a turn or two. Uh, it isn't really worth it. I would def I would stick to the cheaper units. Um, but anyway, it was enough to win this run, so I'm not going to complain there. Um, but yeah, remember, you know, don't be afraid. At least have two high quality banner units. You're kind of not making 
any advantage of the um, the descending if you don't do that. I'd say at least two, ideally three, uh, high quality banner units are what you want to target here. You could even do four if you can guarantee that they all at least can have good upgrades on them. Um, also remember you have the extra upgrade space. I didn't really utilize that much on this run, but uh, yeah, I, I would say the upgrade space is almost a little bit at odds with the, the descend here because you either get one or two really good banner units or you get like three or four okay banner units. Um, you know, you're not probably not going to be able to pour three upgrades in all your banner units. Uh, but anyway, and, and also if you can find, I didn't find it here, but uh, there's the micro stone. That would obviously be a very good uh, upgrade for the units here. Stealthiest bosses. Um, now this one is interesting because uh, you know before I used the the dire channel um, uh, champ for this, right? Not so good here though uh, because you enter with uh, all of that dazed, right? So. You kind of um, you kind of inclined to just take a uh, a thorn unit, right? You don't need and you don't need thorn hollow, but in this case, why not? I mean, if you get offered it, why not? Uh, so I I do say primordium is the best here, and you might think it's like at odds with yourself because the dazed if you do superfood is pr pretty much going to make your dude completely days but you also got to remember that because remember the dazed is every status effect is times two so the dazed it's just gonna you're just gonna be permanently dazed if you go in at the top floor which you typically want to do with primordium but it's fine here if you're gonna if you can find some uh some spikes because remember the the since it's times two and then they start with five stealth it's actually 10 stealth um even dire channel is gonna have a tough time with that so in this case since you have so many status cards available with Awoken, uh, you might as well go with Primordium here, even if you're going to permanently daze your dude at the top. Because as long as you can find any of the plethora of spike applicators, you can just stick one of them on your superfood Primordium, and you're going to stack so many spikes. Because um, remember, it's double application per time, which also counts for the transfer. So I had... I think I had like a thousand spikes when I fought Seraph. It was pretty ridiculous, along with like a shard channeler behind it. But none of that was really needed. Like th this, so this uh, this fight is super easy. Like ironically, just cause it, as long as you go this route, because it, I mean, if you think about it, um, you got pyre shards, right? Which is uncommon. You got razor, uh, or not? Uh, you have sharpen, which is a common. And then you have two rares, uh, Cycle of Life and, um, oh, what's that one called? Uh, Spreading Spores. All of those are spike applicators. On top of that, you have like Thorned Hollow, which just simply giving them regen is going to give them spikes. It's not going to be as insane as, as those other ones since you can stick those ones straight onto Primordium. But even, even the fact that you're getting double spikes from the regens on Thorned Hollow is usually going to be good enough um, and everything else is just icing on the top of the cake. Uh, so you know any sort of sharpen is really not that uncommon to find as long as you can find one you know make it cheap so it's not awkward to play and just stick it on your primordium you could even put like hole over on it and you'll have stupid amounts of anything and you also have uh, damage shield um, which is going to get double applicated. Your Primordium, by the way, gets the Buffet double applicated. So if you start Superfood, you already get six stats, which is pretty ridiculous. <laughs> uh, or six stacks of it to eat. So yeah, pretty powerful. I think this is pretty much built for Primordium and uh, Spikes, this, this challenge. I mean, it's so easy with it. Uh, also, any regen, uh, rage, anything like that is going to double apply. Um, yeah, I, I you'd be doing you'd have to low roll pretty hard, even like lifesteal, like you'd have to lo low roll so hard to not to not beat this one with this combo. And then the final one here, 
uh, which is certainly a pain, but I actually think for me, ironically enough, Largest Lads was the toughest one. Either that or the one with the targeting um, and the unit shifting. Those were probably my two ones that I had to, to like attempt the most. Blighted Existence, I think I actually beat it on my second try. Um, but anyway, not to make anyone jealous or anything. I'm, I'm here to help. So Blighted Existence, you're definitely going to want Stitch and Guard exiled 100% no matter what you do. Now, I, I recommend my, my you know, my Awoken and Stitch and Incant strategy here. Provides a lot of card draw, and it provides, like right off the bat, I mean, the nice thing about World and Ten is like, you know, you gotta, you gotta know, even though your your card, uh, your hand in this case is all permafrosted, you still want to be able to draw a lot on that first turn. That way, if there are dead weights, you can get them out of the way quick and then start drawing into your actual cards. Now the reason you want Stygian Guard exiled is these foregone powers, they're gonna, you know, they discard stuff at random, and a lot of times it's gonna be your main way to get your dead weights out until you can find additional discard options. Um, yeah, and you know, it'll be variant how much you're offered, but if I find any sort of discard, uh, it'll, I'll probably take it. Um, even like something like Drain, which I don't normally value this card super high. I even put it on a holdover here. Um, I probably should have put offering token on holdover. The reason I didn't do offering token here is because I, uh, other than uh, I, I didn't have any actual offering targets. Uh, so I preferred tr a drain here. I could have also done like Titan's Gratitude, although I think I had it double upgraded by the time I found holdover. Um, but anyway, you know, getting those dead weights out of your hand is going to be very ideal. Um, uh, beyond that, it's the typical incant strategy that I out outlined in my incant guide just with a much heavier focus on adding discards. Also, these uh, Calcified Embers, they really want to get played in the first three fights, um, you know, all the way up to that first boss, uh, because I find that's where you have the most luxury to, to purge those from your deck, um, you know, to dedicate three energy to a whole turn of playing them just because the first rings are typically going to be easier. Uh, if you still have, if you have a significant amount of them in your deck after that, you're going to have a rough time removing them and you may even have to spend gold because you, if you think about it like mid to late game, you really don't have the luxury a lot of the time to spend a whole three ember just on purging a card and doing nothing, right? So that's definitely something to think about. Um, I also did high roll here on the... Uh, the Vengeful Staff, which, you know, with that many Blight cards in your deck, you're getting a crap load of um, energy. And at that point, I was like, okay, I'll remove the Vengeful Shards because seven dead weights is certainly enough. Um, but yeah, other than that, it, it's... With this combo, I don't think it's too difficult. It only took me two tries. In the first try, it was another one of those where it was Seraph the Patient, and I was... I would have beaten any other version of Seraph, but you know, Seraph the Patient is balanced and whatnot, so had to restart that one. But surprisingly, I don't think it is the hardest one. Um, I would I would lean toward Largest Lads and uh, whatever that's is it Dangerous Minds, um, yeah, whatever whatever the one that shuffles all your units around and doesn't allow you to target things. I, I think those are the two hardest for me, but. Yeah, that's pretty much gonna do it here. Hopefully that was helpful. Again, I you know I highly recommend checking out some of those other guides to really get into the nitty gritty of some of these combos, like like the incant strategy and whatnot. Um, hopefully this is helpful. Uh, if there are really specific questions about any particular challenge, please let me know in the comments, and I'll respond and give you any follow up advice. Um, yeah, thanks for watching and. Uh, until next time.